Hi everyone, my name is Dr Matt Williams. I'm a tutor in politics and what is known as the Access Fellow here at Jesus College at the University of Oxford. Now in today's video about writing better essays, we're going to be talking about essay structure, which is so important I can't emphasise it to you enough. And if you stick around uh, to the end of the video, I'll explain how I came top of the year uh, from the entirety of my undergraduate degree. Because honestly, this is a skill that's so empowering that it's well worth practising and practising and practising and it will make you a much better student and it will take you very far in life. But it's the sort of thing that students do often underestimate the importance of, so that's why I really wanted to make this video. So why bother? Well, I guess I've kind of given a bit of the game away. It's just incredibly important, but also ironically, a well-structured essay sets you free. So you might think that a, that a highly structured essay where you've put your points in a quite a particular order and you've explained that order to your readers is quite restrictive. Uh, it's not, it's actually, it's freeing, it's liberating, and primarily because it helps you express yourself and it helps you get understood. That's proper English. <laughs> you know, it makes you more comprehensible to your readers. And that's just so important, right? Ultimately, you're writing this for an audience. You're not just allowing things to tumble out of your head uh, onto a page for your own sake. You're doing it for somebody else's benefit so that they can learn from your thinking and they can see that you have generated great critical thinking skills and that means you've got to be communicative and structure is communicative so ironically i would say structure sets you free and it gives you fantastic power one thing to think about is imagine you're a lawyer you're going to court and you're going to fight a particular case you know essays are quite argumentative at least they are typically in british universities and in specifically here in oxford you know, if you were a lawyer going into court trying to defend someone from prison and you didn't organise your arguments and you weren't clear whether or not they were guilty, it's a bad day for your client, right? They're going to go straight to jail and it's going to be your fault to quite a significant extent. So imagine you're a lawyer in every essay you write. If you're sort of just allowing points to be put forth in a totally random haphazard order as they just come out of your brain, then the audience, who in a courtroom would be you know, judge and jury, but in an essay will be your examiners and other people, they're just gonna to be totally confused and it's really gonna you know, blunt the impact of your work. And you really don't want that. You want your work to have as much punch and power as possible, okay? So I would go so far as to say that the organization is over 90% of the case itself. The way you put the points together helps make the case. And indeed, you'll probably do it without noticing because you know, when you have certain points that you want to make to try and advance a particular point, a particular argument, you'll start putting them in a certain order anyway. And that is your brain being led by what other people think, okay? And this is why it's so crucial. You've got to know what you're doing. You've got to know why you want to put points in a certain order. So I'm a politics tutor, right? And one of the most common points that students start with in politics essays is to do with the economy. Now, what they're doing there is that they're basically just, they've learned from everyone else that, you know, the amount of money is often one of the most fundamental and important things in any political question. But that just means they're being dragged around by other people's views. They could stand up and say, do you know what, I'm not going to start with the economy, I'm going to start with something completely different to try and solve this puzzle, because I want to solve it for myself. Or they could start with the economy, but explain why they think they think they ought to start with the economy, not why someone else thinks they ought to start with the economy. Okay, so whether you're conscious of it or not, your brain is going to be trying to put points in a certain order, but you've got to be conscious of it, you've got to be self-aware, because the minute you're unconscious is when you lose power and your audience gets confused. Okay, so that's why you should bother. Right, in fact, you should structure everything in an essay, not just the whole essay itself, but everything, every sentence, every paragraph, besides the whole uh, essay itself. So how do you structure a sentence? Well, you just gotta keep them short and sweet, right? You have gotta make sure we know who's kicking whom. If you write very long, complicated sentences, it's gonna be difficult. Go and see my video on George Orwell's six rules of writing well, if, uh, if you're not sure about this. But the, the gap between the subject, the object and the verb of every sentence needs to be pretty small and clear and easy. It's quite common for students to write in a way that's quite flowery, uh, a bit poetic almost. And that's usually, it's not always going to be the case, but that's usually not what's being called for. What's being called for is good evidence of critical thinking. And clarity is so important. So short, simple sentences is usually better than very long, very complicated sentences with lots of clauses and lots of long, complicated technical words. 
that just confuse people usually and lead to more questions rather than solving questions. Okay, so be careful with punctuation. If you're tempted to put in a semicolon or an ellipsis or a dash or whatever, think about why not just have a full stop? Why not start a new sentence? It might make everyone's life a lot easier. Okay, and then how to structure your paragraphs? Well, there are broadly speaking two approaches to this and they've got some useful acronyms. The first is Peel and the second is Peter, but they achieve pretty much the same sort of approach. So the Peel approach is make your point, then provide some evidence for that point, then explain the point and then link back to your overall argument and also link to the next point that's coming along. The Peter approach is point, evidence, technique, so that's the sort of techniques used to generate that evidence, the methods, if you like, then explanation, then reflection. Now, either of those would work fine and of course it will depend a little bit on the type of essay you're writing or the type of university that you're attending but the general point is that each paragraph needs to be like a mini essay it needs to have a beginning a middle and an end it needs to have its own logical internal structure and crucially it must link to the next paragraph provide some linking sentences that explain why you're moving from next from this point on to the next one. It's so common for students to just finish a point and then start with a new one and it's almost like they've jumped from one stepping stone to another and it's just a bit confusing. You want there to be a really obvious thread that's linking all of your points beautifully together. Okay, so overall how do you structure the whole essay? Well you've got to have a plan, right? If you fail to plan you should plan to fail, right? Poorly planned essays are obvious the, the second you start reading them because the the points are just a jumble you've got you've got what I would describe as a shopping list rather than a recipe there's lots of ingredients laid out there but there's no sense of how those ingredients mix together to form the argument again going back to you being a lawyer in court and you're trying to convince the jury that your clients not guilty but you're just bafflingly throwing out points here there and everywhere and they just cannot understand how they connect together so you've got to have a plan, right? And it doesn't matter how little time you've got for writing your essay, you've got to plan it. And in order to plan an essay, you've got to focus on the question. You've got to be led by the question, okay? And one technique you can use in order to work out how to focus your, the structure of your essays is the bunny ears technique. So bunny ears as in putting quotation marks around important words, okay? Because that can help you focus your mind on what are we fighting about? So remember, you're like a lawyer in court. Lawyers in criminal trials are fighting over not guilty. That's the focus of their fight. That's what they're all gonna be scrapping and bickering about. And in your essays, there'll be a word or a couple of words that you're also gonna be fighting about. So let me give you a couple of examples, or four examples in fact, uh, from different exams. These are all Oxford University exam questions from different subjects. So the first one comes from law. Do judges exercise illegitimate power in the United Kingdom Constitution? Do judges exercise illegitimate power in the United Kingdom Constitution? The fight, the focus of the fight in this case is the word illegitimate. So I would structure my points in a way that breaks up the concept of illegitimate into certain sub points that can all then be linked together in order to make my case that yes, judges do exercise illegitimate power or no, they do not exercise illegitimate power or they do exercise illegitimate power but only in these ways but not in these other ways, right? Those are basically the three essays that are possible, that are allowable <laughs> for this question, okay? The next question comes from philosophy. How do we perceive change? Now the bunny is there I've put around perceive. Obviously the word change is interesting and debatable but it's how we perceive change that the fight is focused on here. Okay, that's the thing that every paragraph, every point, every sentence needs to be focused on. And if it's not, then I'm not answering the question. And if I'm not answering the question, I'm not getting any marks. Okay, you've got to be really ruthless with yourself. Third question comes from history. Was the Tudor dynasty securely established by 1509? So I put the bunny ears around established because that's what we're fighting about. That's the debate. That's the not guilty in this instance, right? So my plan has to work around that. Final example comes from politics. Does democracy cause growth? Now, there's a lot of ambiguity in this question, but growth is the ultimate thing that we are trying to explain and its connection to democracy. So I would probably split up growth into certain aspects uh, and try and work out its connection to democracy. Or I would try and find some way of structuring my points around those words, okay? So that's the, the approach to making, uh, to using bunny ears. Okay, now then we need to think about what makes sense as a story. How can you link your points together in a way that makes sense? You want them to progress, so you want it to feel like the, this 
point leads naturally on to the next point, or at least leads on to the next point in a way you can explain, even if it's not natural, because what is natural depends on a person's perspective, okay? So there are, to my mind, four fundamental ways to structure an essay, okay? And I've got some little diagrams to try and uh, illustrate these. So the first is a timeline. So one thing happened earlier than another thing, and therefore we go through them chronologically, point by point. Okay, so that is a logical structure. It can mean that you tend to focus on the passage of time rather than the actual sort of points that matter, perhaps. And so that approach can, can also lead to sort of heavy description where you say this thing happened, then that thing happened, and less analysis. Analysis is usually where the marks are at. So be careful with timelines. That's why they sometimes don't work. What might be more effective is the mechanism, which is kind of similar to a timeline where you're saying one thing goes in and another thing comes out. But there, rather than focusing on time as being what causes change, you're focusing on the actual mechanics by which change occurs. This, of course, would only be relevant if the essay was about dynamism, about change, about things going in and coming out of a perceived mechanism. Okay? Another approach is called a funnel structure, which is where you work from the, the largest possible wide angle of view down to the narrowest view. So it could be, for example, if you start by looking at an entire society and then you zoom in on an individual actor. So it could be that you talk about how an entire society felt about a certain thing and then how an individual politician managed that thing. So that's a funnel structure where you're kind of zooming in, if you like. And then finally, there's a feedback loop where you have a cycle of points where one point leads to the next and then leads on to a third point and then that leads to a fourth point and then it starts back again at the beginning. And it's just up to you to determine where the beginning is and go through those points in a way that makes sense to you and makes sense crucially to your readers okay so let me give you an example for that question about whether or not democracy causes growth okay so what i might do is split up into three fundamental points i'm going to make about growth and i'm going to explain how growth depends on trust between individuals because what you need for growth is to be able to put your money in a business and for that business then to grow because the business can depend on certain things happening and it being able to securely continue its operations and stuff like that. So I'm going to focus on the parts of democracy that contribute to different parts of that growth approach, right? So I've got laid out a very simple plan here with seven paragraphs, starting off with the introduction where I'm just going to say what I'm going to do in the essay. I'm going to lay out the fundamental argument I'm going to make and I'm going to lay out my roadmap, which is where I explain what points I'll make and in what order. It's an incredibly useful thing to have. It only needs to be a sentence where you just say, I will go through these points in this order and that, that'll be that. Thanks very much. My next paragraph will deal with some fundamental conceptual definitions, things that need to be pinned down, like the word growth. What does that mean? Are we talking about growth in general and uh, gross domestic product? Yeah, it's just a very sort of classic definition. Then I'll go through the points. Now, what I'm suggesting here could be um, you know, thought of as an inverted funnel in that I'm starting at the narrowest point and widening out to the, to the biggest point. So start by point one with democratic culture, which is where, how, where each individual trusts other individuals to a certain extent because they are citizens in a democracy. So I'm starting at the individual level with culture. And then I'm expanding to institutions at the mid-level and then I'm going to the widest point, which is how democracies between countries trade with each other and how they grow together. So those are my points and I put them in that order. And I put them in that order starting at the narrowest point because I think how individuals think of themselves in democracies is the ultimate driver of growth. That's what I think really, really matters. So that's why I put it first, right? Remember, you know, put, put your best goods at the shop window. Your most important point kind of needs to go first. And if you can think about a plan that can help deliver that important point, that would be really helpful. Okay. Then my sixth paragraph will deal with some caveats and counter arguments. This is not so that I completely tear apart my own argument, but it's so that I strengthen it because I say what's, what could be better about it, what other people think, and why with respect they are wrong, and I'm going to continue with my, my own original argument. And then f finish off number seven with conclusion where I just say what I said. Okay. Now, once you start thinking about a plan, you'll start to notice that there's a bigger picture. You've got an ultimate sort of theory that links together all of your separate points and that is where you're going to really communicate your vision most clearly right you, you work out the bigger picture so the bigger picture 
in that plan about the connection between growth and democracy is that in democracies, I'm, I could argue that trust creates growth and trust is more common in democracies. And so that's my sort of bigger picture argument. And that's the thread, the beautiful golden thread that links all of my points together. Rather than me offering lots of separate ingredients, I've got a recipe now, okay? Now, how about standing out from the crowd and getting the highest marks? Well, the trick that I pulled uh, in uh, university was being a real contrarian. <laughs> so I would find an argument that I thought no one else would be willing to argue. I would counter intuition. Again, a bit, a bit like being a lawyer, I would pick up the briefs that were unwinnable, if you like, or at least everyone thought were unwinnable. And that would therefore show off my skills to a much higher level. And it also forced me to think about the arguments. Rather than me just trotting out arguments that everyone else makes, I was definitely making my own arguments. Now you've got to be careful with this because of course the danger is that you say something that's completely unsustainable. <laughs> um, so you've got to make sure you can back yourself up. But fundamentally, it doesn't really matter what you, what you think, it matters what you can prove, okay? So if you want to show off your thinking skills, don't worry about what you believe in. So I, I might believe that democracy generally causes growth, but that doesn't matter. I'm going to argue it doesn't, just so I can show off, okay? <laughs> and it, it kind of works, provided you, you do it carefully. So here's you know, an approach you could make to say that democracy doesn't cause growth because planning is what's needed for growth and democracies are not terribly good at long-term planning. And actually the bits of democracies that do help with growth are the parts that are nothing to do with popular will. It's things like courts and rule of law and human rights which are more parts of the liberal aspect of a liberal democracy. It's the things that constrain popular will. That's the stuff that helps, helps businesses grow. And you know, one telling point is that no business is a democracy. I mean, you've got shareholders who can vote, I guess, but you know, the, the way that businesses are organized tend to be quite authoritarian. And <laughs> that's because they wouldn't want to constantly vote on everything that they were doing because it would mean that planning would be confused and muddled and could change very quickly and probably wouldn't work. So I'm gonna try and argue that democracy cannot cause growth and I'm gonna do that not because I believe it, but because it'll show off my skills to a greater extent, okay? And then again, after my introduction, I'll go through some definitions and I'm gonna have this thread going all the way through, which is that actually growth requires planning and that's, that's what's needed. Uh, and I'll go through point one, and again, I'll talk, start with democratic culture. And so I'll start at the, the, sort of the individual level. How do individuals in a democracy think and feel, and how are they acculturated? And then I'll go to point two, which is sort of mid-level about democratic institutions, and point out that it's not the ones that have anything to do with popular will that drive growth. It's not the legislatures, it's not the referendums, it's the courts. And the courts are kind of counter-majoritarian, they're almost anti-democratic, some would argue. Okay, and then point three, uh, I'll talk about how democracies interact with each other and show that that doesn't necessarily have anything to do with growth either. And then at each point I'm making, I'm introducing caveats. So again, this is not so I sit on the fence so that I say, well, I could argue this or I could argue that. I'm saying at every stage, I argue this. Other people might think that, and here's why with respect they're wrong. And I'm just stress testing my argument. I'm just allowing my readers the opportunity to, to to know that I've thought of their suspicions and their concerns and I've addressed them, okay? So that's why that can really work. And then I finish off with a conclusion, job done, okay? So that's the trick and it is just a trick. It's not nothing to do with genius. And ultimately this is why you should bother because structuring your essays will make you much more powerful and ironically it really sets you free. So give it a try, see how you get along. Let me know in the comments if you have any questions or comments and I'll see you next time. Thanks so much for watching, bye now.